This is Martin Kavanagh here. I'm introducing you to our breeding and fertility management panel this evening. We're here on the farm of James Hanley in Horse and Jockey, and I'd just like to introduce you to the panel members. We have Ben Slee, who is an AI technician and breeding advisor with Munster Bovine. Dennis Howard, who is the technical advisor and veterinary surgeon with Munster Bovine. We have James Hanley, who's the owner of this farm. Uh, we have Trevor Hanley, who is a breeding advisor with Progressive Genetics and George Beatty, uh, a farmer from Blessington. But first, let's get a bit of context for our discussion through some interviews we've recorded with our panelists. So today we're going to be talking to Fergal and Ben, two AI technicians, one from Munster and one from Progressive Genetics. And we're going to be getting a little bit of an insight on how the breeding season are going uh, is going to go. So lads, starting breeding season, everything is getting really busy. What kind of prep would you advise farmers to, to have now? Or where, where do they get started getting ready for you guys to come into yard? Well, I suppose the, the most important thing is to speak to all your farmers before you go to them for the start of the season to do what we said, you know, picking out the right bulls um, for them. Um, also just when you've been doing it a few years, you have a, have a route that you generally stick to and farmers get used to you being there. But you go in and make sure that they've got their facilities right, clean, um, they're going to be organised on a day-to-day -day basis. But it sort of pretty much runs itself after doing it for a few years, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So lads, like farmers may be contemplating AI for the first time, uh, haven't done it before, this is their first year, what advice would you give them uh, to start AI, what, what advice would you give them getting into it? They, they shouldn't be nervous, it's just to make contact with their technician or the breed advisor and it'll all roll on smoothly from that. So guys, do you see any advantage or disadvantage in G1 bulls? Is there, are they more popular? Are guys using more of them? And, you know, bigger bull teams, is, do you see a lot more lads using bigger bull teams? Is Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, if you put your, all in your, your eggs in one basket, uh, it's not a good idea. You want a, a big team of bulls, really especially using young genomic bulls. You can lessen it with, with daughter proven bulls. But what I'm finding anyway is that uh, the majority of people will use the young genomic bulls rather than the daughter proven. You've still got guys that insist on daughter proven, but they're in the minority. Well, the advantage is you're getting the, the young bull very quick with, uh, with the high EBI figures. The disadvantage is if them figures fall on them. And that's, I suppose that's the secret. Use, using a spread of bulls and only using a few straws of G1, G1 bulls because we don't have any field fertility. If you use a lot of them and the field fertility isn't great, then you're going to come unstuck and you're going to lose three weeks. Do you notice any new trends kind of happening or any particular trends uh, with your customers? Uh, are guys focusing more on fertility, protein? What, what are you seeing? Not really because uh, they have their breed advice done and they are going on health, fertility, solids. There's such a variation in bulls, and they're used, that's why they're using a the team of bulls to suit the cows that they have in their herd. I think they're doing a lot less Frisian now than they were 10 years ago. If they were doing a 12-week breeding pre uh, season, they were doing nine weeks Frisian and three weeks beef. I'm finding now, I'm sure you are as well, yeah, that it's, it's three longer. weeks, probably three to four weeks Frisian, and then, and onto, beef then onto beef. What, what advice would you give uh, farmers or uh, about synchronizing and maybe the benefits is there any labor saving benefits to it what, what, what would you reckon? Well, synchronizing is very good and it's been very accurate um, stick to the program when they've talked to their vet stick to the program if they're doing their injections at nine o'clock in the morning keep them at the same time all along speak to their technician before they started to be sure that he's on board for coming the, with the dates and times that suit him and yeah, the sink has been very good, can be very good and can be a big uh, help towards labour down the line because you're over in 10 days. Just make sure on the day there's plenty of extra labour there to make it that you're actually AIing the animals at the time of day that they should be AIed at and it's not dragging on and then you'll see better results. Make sure the vets know when you're coming. There's no good three or four farmers ringing you and wanting you on the 2nd of May. I find that on the cows, if you do them naturally, you'll get a, as, as good a conception rate as using um, conventional. The heifers, I would synchronise them. There's different programmes in the synchronisation. There's several farms that I go to and they would uh, AI for five, or, five to six days and anything that hasn't cycled, they inject with estrimate after 
which they get from their vet and the rest of the cow the rest of the heifer should have cycled within two to three days after that so they have their heifers finished within ten days that bulls off and that's it and concentrate on their cows after that they like it because it's cheaper isn't it yeah it's yeah. cheaper than the yeah. full synchronization cheaper yeah. option it's very important to um, talk to your vet between the two of you and talking to your breeding advisor technician um, to suggest which program will suit you it's a really busy time breeding season you're hopping in and out of yards from a health and safety point of view, what do you guys kind of want to see on farms? You'd like to see good holding facilities there where the head gate is in good working order, an anti backing bar, the cow can't come back on you, uh, crush and holding pen in just in good order, good working order. The cows are, the cows are being held there and you're safe. And also, I suppose, hygiene as well. We want to be working in a clean environment. It's also better for the cows. It's got, you know, it's far, e far better for conception rate if everything's clean. So why not have it like that? And it, once you do it every day, clean it out after we've been there, it's there ready for the next day. Yeah, and another thing, maybe not leaving a cow on her own in a pen, sometimes can have them a bit freaked out, especially with a suckler cow, they, can, they don't like to be on their own. Dennis, um, what I want to ask you as technical manager in, 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 in Munster, I, I'm very conscious of the confidence people have with AI, confidence we have with fertility in bulls and so on. And I think when I say fertility in bulls, I mean their, their, their conception rate, what they're able to achieve out, out in the field. J just give me a little bit of background in, in how we're picking bulls and how we're managing that in terms of putting semen into the marketplace. Yeah, I suppose we call it field fertility, Martin. So this, this is something we monitor for all the bulls on a continuous basis. And that's their ability to put cows and calf in the field on a continuous basis. So that is something we monitor. If, if a bull has poor field fertility, you know, we don't use them. You know, even though it might be a very good bull, we take the decision not to use them because... So, so will you drop a bull out of circulation if you're finding in the season that that conception rate is not working correctly will, for you? We will, we will, even okay. during the season or before the season. We might, we might take the, the decision to, to actually leave a bull out based on, on poor field fertility. So just to, I suppose it's something for herd owners to be, to be aware of that we are, we are continuously monitoring that. Okay, and that's a responsibility. We, we look at that responsible breeding, not to have bulls out in the field that will provide risk there in terms of the, the Exactly, herd sure. Like it's, it's one thing getting you know, high genetic merit sires into a herd, but the other big piece is maximizing the six week calving rate, minimizing the empty rate. So we want to get a high conception rate from our side. You know, the farmer wants a high submission rate. If we can get a high conception rate, we're gonna achieve that high six week calving. And that really drives the whole system as regards days and milk okay. compact calving. Some people want to use G1 bulls or test bulls. What's our advice there? Yeah, so obviously the Gene Ireland program, that, that limits. Um, so we want to test these bulls because we, we need these bulls coming into the breeding program yep. to be the sires of the future. But we want to test them in a responsible way. So that means getting them out to a big spread of herd owners, using them through the technician service over a large number of herds. Um, and using a pack of, so it's a pack of bulls, goes out, you know, so it's maybe seven, seven by seven, 49 straws, so there's no bull going to be overused in any one herd. So these are bulls, they've obviously, they're young yearling bulls, they've passed all the laboratory tests, but we don't know how they're going to perform out in the herd, either from a genetic point of view or a fertility point of view. So that's why we want to um, use them responsibly. Okay, so people can join the Gene Ireland program or they can get a limited amount of test bulls in their tank. Exactly, so yeah. the Gene Ireland program is, is the first port to call anyway and there's a, we, we release a small amount on top of that because we want to just get a, to, to get enough, enough used to have good confident figures for the following year. Okay, might follow a little bit with sex then, people again having confidence with using sex semen. What sort of recommendations in terms of precautions to make sure that we maintain herd fertility with sex semen? Yeah, yeah, so look, the product is very good, but mm. um, what it is, I suppose the product, the semen has gone through the sexing process. The dose and the straw is lower, you know, whether it is two million or four million, mm. I suppose put some extra precautions in on the herds we're using it in, on the animals we're using it in and actually how we're using it on the day then as regards timing of AI and selecting the cows. Okay, so first of all, if we're selecting the herd, the herd must be, must be what, Dennis? Ideally, we want a high fertility herd that's achieving a high six week calving rate. Within that herd then, we want to select cows that are calved 60 plus days, that are in good body condition score, three plus, that have had no health events at calving or since. Healthy, cycling cows in good body condition score, 
ideally parity one to four, so we don't want to use it on, on older cows, they're going to have slightly lower fertility. Um, and just watch the first calvers as well, that, they're in, that they are in good body condition score, that they've coated off. Um, so a little bit, be a, a little bit more careful with them. Okay, so it's so a real good, good nutritional base. We're on a rising plane of nutrition, and also not selecting any cow that is lame or has mastitis or any any other issue knocking around. Absolutely. So we're trying to stack from from the herd owner point of view. We're trying to stack all the odds in your favour. You know, so selecting. Okay. Yeah. As regards using, if I'm using sex semen, I'm using maybe 50, 60 straws of sex semen. How many bulls should I have in there in that team? The exact same rules apply. We want to use a team of bulls, so that's that's about you know spreading the risk again, both from a genetic and a fertility point of view. If we're using 50 or 60 straws, we want to use a minimum of three bulls, I would say, for, for that number of straws. Okay, minimum yeah. of three. And then we're getting into higher numbers or bigger synchronizations, uh, programs and so on with sex. We're looking at even a bigger team, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Increase it accordingly, I suppose, okay. as the numbers go up. Okay, yeah. so mentioning synchronization then, it's getting a bit more popular. It's not, it's not for everybody, mm -hmm. and we're making choices we can synchronize heifers or synchronize cows. So maybe in synchronizing heifers, first of all, one or two key rules in terms of synchronizing heifers. Whether to sexed or conventional, um, I suppose one message is that synchronization doesn't, come over, doesn't overcome poor management, so the heifers need to be up to their target weight for, for their genetics. So we'll say if they're a maintenance figure of 10, they need to be over 350 kilos in weight. They want to be in good body condition score, kind of 325 mm. plus. Um, they want to be, you know, ideally out, out on grass on a stable, rising plane of nutrition, gaining weight. Um, so all those things, we want to really stack the odds in our favour, whether it is sex or conventional, to make sure we get the best outcome. And you made a nice reference there. Look at the maintenance score within your, or the maintenance sub-index within your EBI to gauge how big your heifers actually should be. Yeah, Yeah, I suppose, you know, that maintenance figure is, is the, the genetic live weight of the animal mm. and the target weight for the heifer at bulling is going to depend on that. So. Um, obviously, if the lower the maintenance, the higher the target. Um, you know, there's a nice little calculator online there that the Tagish have that you can punch in the, the maintenance figure, and it will spit out all the various metrics of, of the target for you know the mature weight and the target of breeding. Okay, so advantage of synchronization with sext in terms of timing, because I know, or, or maybe you can explain it a, a, a little bit. There's a, a difference with the timing of AI with sex semen. I suppose one of the challenges with using sext is we need to be more precise with the timing so the, the, the sperm cells don't last as long inside in the cow. Um, they're also gone through a maturation process during the sexing so they're kind of ready to go quicker when they get into the cow. Mm. So all that means we need to be more precise with our timing and the rule mm. is 14 to 20 hours after the start of standing heat. Generally what that means for the herd owner is if the technician is coming at 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning those cows need to be in standing heat the previous milking or okay. the previous evening or the previous afternoon from lunchtime up to milking. I suppose one of the advantages of synchronization then is it allows us to overcome the timing. So those modern synchronization programs, they're fixed time AI. So for example, that 10 day cow program um, where, where AI is taking place from nine o'clock to one o'clock mm -hmm. on, on, mm -hmm. the day of, um, on the day of AI. With sext, that program is ideal and maybe there's actually a slight benefit to pushing out the time of AI closer to, closer to lunchtime, okay. so going 20, even 22 hours after the last shot of GNRH. Um, so that might help the technician as well. If you have a bunch of cows for sex semen, maybe on that morning he can come a bit later, he's under a bit less pressure, and spend the time to do those, those cows for sex semen. Just to sum up all of this piece, pick the right cows, get your nutrition right, uh, line yourself up well for having a lot of success with AI, whether you go conventional or sexed. Absolutely. Basic rules apply, whether it is conventional or sexed. So getting your timing right, having your nutrition and right, picking your cows, um, especially for sexed, picking the cows to give yourself the absolute best chance of success. John Heslin here from MSD Animal Health. Uh, good afternoon, Rose. We're here to talk about uh, dairy calves and dairy calf to beef uh, in particular. Um, so if we get into a bit of a, a discussion around that, um, if we deal with the dairy farmer, you know, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of expansion, a lot of folks on replacement heifers. But what we want to discuss today is a little bit more on that kind of beef focus from, from the dairy herd. Mm -hmm. So what, is your, what are your thoughts on, on beef breeding from the dairy herd? Yeah, good afternoon, John. Um, I suppose the first thing we're seeing is that um, right now we're we're a situation with uh, with our dairy cow population that, that that is plateauing. 
we've come from um, a time of, of, um, of expansion. And uh, with the dairy cow population plateauing, at the moment, 50% um, of the calf crop from the dairy herd is beef, and that percentage will actually increase with the increased use of sex semen on the dairy herd. Traditionally, dairy farmers would have got their replacements um, early on in the season, and they would have used beef bulls, um, AI sires, at the end of the season. Now dairy farmers are selecting their cows from the very start that they want to get their replacements from, and then that they're their high EBI, um, high production cows, their most profitable cows, and they're selecting cows for beef breeding from the very start. That's very good. So traditionally, you mentioned traditionally dairy rows. Um, I'd say it's fair to say that traditionally dairy farmers would focus on you know AI genetics for their for their replacements, and then they might throw out a bull out to the field and just get that cow and calf. Would you say that that's that mindset is is shifting somewhat? And what are we doing to try and try and increase that mindset to or enhance it into focus on beef AI and continue to use AI in in the dairy herd as well? Yeah, it's interesting, as, as, um, as the dairy herd increased and dairy herds got bigger, um, dairy farmers tended to um, continue the AI into the beef AI, and we're seeing beef AI in the dairy herd increasing over the last number of years, and that trend is continuing. And I suppose the reasons are, it's easier to continue to AI because the cows are coming in twice a day anyway for milking. It's hard to manage large number of stock bulls, so the number of bulls on farms have reduced and the, the beef AI in dairy farms has increased. And also from a dairy farmer's point of view, using beef AI, um, he's getting a couple of great advantages from using uh, beef AI. And the first big thing for a dairy farmer is security of calving. He does not want nasty surprises. And that's the big advantage using beef AI in the dairy herd because um, our whole program is designed around small calves at birth, but also quality calves that go through to finish and can go through to finish profitably for the calf rarer and finisher. Um, so from a dairy farmer's point of view, his security of calving, because we've so much data behind our bulls, he can have short gestation bulls that he'll use at the end of the season. And also because we test so many bulls, we can identify those real diamonds that are really easy calving and, and, produce, and have high beef value at the end of the day. So he gets three advantages from using beef AI, calving, short gestation and quality. So Rose, you, you had mentioned about the increased usage of AI uh, on dairy farms, um, but one thing we'd be aware of is the, the labour challenges that are there. Um, and with AI, you need a lot of time to do heat detection uh, and so on and so forth. But are there, is there anything that the dairy farmers can use or you know, from a technology perspective to increase sex semen? and then continue to use AI for the rest of the breeding. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I suppose um, in dairy farms with the, with the tight calving, um, calving pattern, um, heat detection is not an issue at the start of the season because we have a lot of cows on heat every day. Um, so it's usually in the second three weeks are, you know, if, if, if farmers have a, have, a, have a longer breeding season, that's when they really become unstuck with, with, with heat detection, when, when there's fewer and fewer cows in heat every day. And that's where farmers need the technology. So um, minimum of a vasectomized bull with the, with the chin ball and also the, the newer technologies now with Sense, Sense Hub, for example, um, to help farmers pick up these cows in heat, especially when they're later on in the breeding season when there's fewer and fewer cows in heat. I think technology is going to be, be big to, to increase use of AI technology because we're, we're dealing in very much a technology space. I think moving on to kind of the, the, brief, the breed question, sorry. Um, we get it whether it's on a beef farm or a dairy farm and which breed is better than, than this breed and so on and so forth. But from a, a dairy farmer's perspective, do they need to focus on beef breeds or can they focus within the index to select the bulls that they require for a shorter gestation and calving difficulty? Or would you encourage them to focus on particular breeds? Sure, I suppose, well, I suppose the first thing to say is we have a very good dairy beef index in Ireland. And the dairy beef index tells us about the calving and it tells us about the quality of the calf from um, a finishing point of view. So I would absolutely use our dairy beef index. Use the calving and use the beef sub index. And the great thing about the index is, it doesn't matter whether it's an Angus or a Hereford or an Aubrac or a Charolais, a 4% bull for dairy cow calving difficulty, for example, a 4% Angus bull is the same as a 4% Hereford bull is the same percent as a 4% Charolais bull. So all those indexes can be compared right across the board. I suppose the other thing that's important to say is, when dairy farmers are selecting beef sires from the dairy herd, they need to look at the dairy catalogues. And um, that's where they will find the bulls specifically for the dairy herd. 
um, as opposed to looking at the suckler catalogues. Because all the bulls at the back of the Munster bovine and the Progressive Genetics dairy catalogue are specifically selected for the dairy herd and they're tested in the dairy herd. So absolutely get the numbers right. It's really important to get the calving difficulty right. We all have breed preferences, so within your own breed preference, select the highest beef value within the calving difficulty that suits, um, that suits your cows. And what we really advise dairy farmers to do is to divide out their females into maidens, second calvers, cows and mature cows. And that way they can use better quality bulls as the cows get older and their calving ability increases, but they'll still have no trouble calving. And that's the secret. So we want no trouble calving, but we want to use a better quality bull on our older cows. And then when your cows get to the stage where, you know, for the actual older cows, the six lactation plus, you can pull back a little bit again, because they're the cows that are more likely to be prone to, to milk fever and, and so on um, in their later years. So um, you can really manage it well and select cow bulls specifically to suit the parity of the cow. That's brilliant and I think it's really reassuring for the farmer to know that those bulls have been tried and tested on the dairy herd. I think that's, a, that's an exceptional point. We've talked a lot about the dairy farmer and the bulls that the dairy farmer needs to, to use to produce a nice calf, but I think to, to meet the customer's expectations, which inevitably is the beef farmer, what is the beef farmer looking for from, a, from that calf? You know, we've talked about a short gestation, easy calving, but the beef farmer wants a certain type of calf as well. So what, what oh, would you, absolutely. yeah, what are we looking for there? Um, the first most important thing the beef farmer wants is a healthy calf, and, th and that is key. What a dairy farmer can do is, I mean, the best look penny he could give his customer coming in to buy his calves is uh, vaccination up the nose and make sure the calf has had colostrum. Um, and that's the best thing he can do to make sure that the beef guy is getting a healthy calf. So from the beef guy, he wants a healthy calf and he wants a good quality calf with a good growth rate, good weight gain and has all that good genetics in him that will take him through to slaughter profitably, ideally without going into the second winter. So we need good growth rate, um, early maturing and um, good, uh, good carcass conformation as well. I think you, you, you touched on a lot, of, a lot of great points there for the beef farmer and the dairy farmer. And I think there's a huge opportunity for, for the industry to increase that dairy calf to beef and really focus on the beef breeds uh, being used on the dairy cows. And in truth, if you look across social media, I've seen a lot of uh, Charlie calves off, off dairy cows in recent weeks and look like, look like fine calves. Mm. But you, you touched on the bulls. Can you name a few bulls that you might advise some dairy farmers to use from a, a beef perspective that, that Progressive or Munster bovine would currently have? Sure, and I'll just pull out a few bulls from, from, from every breed. Um, and I suppose also before I start talking specifically about bulls, if we can just think a little bit about the index as well and what to look for in the index. So if you look at the beef sub index, I would be aiming for a minimum of 35. And I know some beef processors now that are recommending, you know, better quality bulls in the dairy herd. That's kind of where they're aiming for in 35. But we have a lot of bulls in the, in our, in the Munster Bovine and Progressive Genetics catalogue that are over 50 and our bulls go right up to 134 on beef sub-index. So, you know, they're, they're the kind of points I'd be th looking at. From the point of view of calving then, if you're talking about maiden heifers, really look at the dairy heifer index. And if you're looking for bulls for dairy cows, look at the dairy cow calving index. So really make that distinction. For dairy maidens, ICBF have um, a risk level for bulls that use in maiden heifers. So it's low, moderate and high. So I would only select the uh, low risk bulls for my dairy maidens. So then just to talk about bulls, we have two super Angus bulls for dairy maidens. They're both 6.4% calving difficulty in dairy maidens and they're rated low risk. Uh, they also have the added benefit of being short gestation. Um, so Matteo um, is, he's AA4089. He's only 6.4% calving difficulty. He's minus four days gestation and he has a beef sub index of 52. So here we have a bull that's easy enough for dairy maidens and he's a beef sub index 12 points higher than the breed average. And that's really what our program is all about. The other bull we have for dairy maidens, the other Angus bull is Gabriel Pat, who's more or less the same profile as, as Matteo. 6.4% um, calving and an excellent beef sub index. Angus bulls for cows, our two top bulls there uh, that we'll be recommending would be uh, Fargal, um, an exceptional bull in dairy cows. He's only 3.3% calving difficulty in dairy cows and um, he's a beef sub index of it's over 60, 62 or 3. Um, and then also we have Maverick, 
Um, it was the second most used bull last year on, um, on dairy cows. And um, he's very easy calving, less than 3%, minus four days in gestation. And he's a beef sub-index of over 60 as well. Um, so you can see where we're going. In our program, we're, we're managing to find bulls that are easier than the breed average and higher beef index than the breed average. Moving on to Herefords then, um, we have a really exceptional bull there, uh, Fisher 1 profile, HE 5346. He's actually the number one bull available in Dairy Beef Index. Um, and again, um, minus two days gestation. He's a beef index of, uh, beef sub index of 52. And uh, he's a calving of under 4%. Um, and then we have a new bull, Zaro, that we're very excited about. He has a beef sub index of 70. Okay. And he's under 4% calving as well. And Angus and Hereford are our two biggest breeds on, on the, in the dairy herd. Um, we also have good demand um, for the Aubrac breed. And um, we have a really top bull there, Turlock Moore Magnificent. And he has a beef sub index of 110. So we were talking earlier about minimum of 35. But as you can see, we have a lot of bulls that are really, really above that point. So uh, Magnificent is 110. About 3% calving difficulty in dairy cows and they calve on time. Other breeds then that we would have demand for Limousine, for example, our top bull there is Castleview Gazelle uh, Zag, and um, he's a beef sub-index of uh, 124. So you're getting right up with the beef sub-index when you move into the continental breeds. And then with our Belgian Blues, um, we have a great choice of Belgian Blues, um, but I suppose our top bull there at the moment is a bull called Marius, BB5226, 8% calving in dairy cows, so he's a bull we'll be recommending for our mature cows. It's 8% calving difficulty, minus one and a half days in gestation, um, but a beef sub-index of 120. So it's really about selecting your bulls according to the parity of your females. And then once you have your calving difficulty sorted, use the highest beef sub-index after that. Very good. You, you've, uh, you've impressed me with remembering all the, the titles, the codes <laughs> and the indexes, so, so well done on that. Um, you, me you mentioned a term earlier on that the Americans use for that smaller calf that has exceptional growth rate. Yes, curve benders. Curve benders. So yeah. that's really what you're focusing on. You're selecting bulls that are producing curve bender calves. Small, Absolutely. Small at birth that have exceptional growth rate. That's what our, that's what our um, breeding program is all about but we can only achieve that by testing bulls. So we have a testing program every year. Um, we test between 15 and 20 bulls every year. And um, we, we don't fall in love with any of our bulls. We, 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 we bring them in and we select them carefully, specifically for the dairy herd. We test them and then we promote the ones that really achieve what we're looking for, which is uh, calving ease, short gestation, and high carcass. I think before we finish, I think uh, a couple of pieces of, of advice from yourself would be fantastic, both for the dairy farmer and the beef farmer, and how they can work together to try and get that relationship growing. You, you mentioned repeat customers and so on and so forth. What, what would your tips be for dairy farmers for the upcoming uh, breeding season? Well, I suppose the big thing for a dairy farmer is more than 50% of his calf crop now is going to be beef. And um, the big thing for the dairy farmer is that he can get a market for all his calves and maximize the value of that calf crop and also get the calves off the farm as early as possible. Um, so then it's all about the genetics. What do I advise the dairy farmer to do? The first thing I advise him to do is do a bit of planning ahead of the breeding season and select his cows for his replacements and select all the rest of his cows for beef bulls. So that's the first thing. Start using beef from the start of the season for the cows he doesn't want replacements from. Um, divide out his cows according to his females according to parity maidens, second calvers, cows and mature cows. Use the appropriate level of calving difficulty for those groups. And that's clearly laid out in our panels in the catalogue. And then use the highest beef sub-index bulls he can find. So we're talking about a minimum of 35, but we've plenty of bulls in the catalogue from 50 up to 124. So I would really be, 35 is really a minimum. And the last thing then, really important point, record the sire of the calf. And that, then you can demonstrate to your calf buyer that you've used these top sires. These are their beef sub-index. So you're telling him, this is what you're going to get now for you to do, carry on your enterprise profitably. Because 45% of beef calves from the dairy herd do not have a sire recorded. And we need to improve on that. On the calf purchaser side, the calf purchaser needs to look at the genetics of what he's buying. 
it's very hard to judge a young calf. For a calf to be easily born, he's going to have to start off small. That doesn't mean that he's not going to have tremendous growth rate afterwards and meet the market specifications later in life. So from the calf buyer, look at the genetics of the calf he's buying. It's really important. Um, build up a relationship with the dairy farmer and you know, um, ask for the vaccination. Uh, make sure the colostrum is done and then he'll have um, exactly what he wants, a healthy calf with good beef, beef capacity to meet the market specs. That's great. Uh, great advice, Rose. Uh, thank you very much. And I think even just the sire recording itself, I know when you, you see a beef animal, a wainland from the beef or a suckler herd come through the ring and you hear it's a, a zag calf or a lapon calf, uh, the ears start to prick up straight away. So I think uh, sire recording and the increased use of beef breeding in the dairy herd will, uh, will ensure that the dairy calf to beef has a, has a positive future for us going forward. Sure. Thanks, John. So I suppose uh, to sum up, it's all possible. It is possible to get your small calves that can go through to beef profitably. And, that, and that's the secret, that, 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 that's what we're trying to achieve. Great point to finish, thanks for us. This is Martin Kavanagh here. I'm introducing you to our breeding and fertility management panel this evening. We're here on the farm of James Hanley in Horse and Jockey. So lads, tonight we're really focusing on this breeding and fertility management piece. Um, and a lot of this is around this area of building a little bit of confidence in sex semen. A lot of farmers out there are kind of wondering about this. Uh, there, may, there might have been the confidence around it. And I know from our experience with Progressive and Munster, we have high <coughs> confidence in using sex semen now. Um, maybe I might come to you directly, James. You mentioned this to me earlier. I mean, we're talking about, um, uh, you know, getting a sex program in and really improving with the labor piece. So this is all about getting compact here. So did you use the synchronization program with this also? Oh, yes, 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 it was the first year. Okay, so this is a synchronization program, breeding your autumn replacement heifers and using sex semen. Yeah. How did you get on? Well, we, we, we did uh, 50, 58 heifers and with about 75% success rate. Now we're due to um, um, scan them this year, to, or this uh, week, to see how the um, success was, but uh, we're very happy with it. Very good, okay, so that's giving you good, good confidence yes. in this. George, I'll ask you the same question. I mean, I know both of you guys are operating with split herds. You have autumn and spring calving here. So how are you using sex semen on your farm, your operation? Uh, I suppose we, we always would have dabbled a little bit with it over the years. Uh, we pedigree herd and a few good heifers here and there. We put by specific straws. But uh, this autumn, well, last spring, we, we did uh, all our spring heifers. Uh, and we had a, a close to an 80% conceptual rate, which was massive for what we thought anyway. And uh, it worked out well. So this autumn, um, we again done all the heifers this autumn uh, with sex semen. Haven't scanned yet, but it, it's looking very promising. Um, mm. And we also have done a, a good few of the autumn cows this year. Uh, we did a pre-scan beforehand just to make sure that they were mm. Okay. Mm. okay. Uh So we picked out a handful of the, the higher EBI ones that maybe we were a bit confident that we had better fertility. Okay. Uh, mostly second calvers, that, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, listen, for us, we had a lot of bull calves, and we're trying to increase numbers and grow the herd. Okay. And we just thought that this is the most efficient way of doing it. So. Okay, so so you're selecting uh, certain cows, and we get into the cow selection a bit more. But I might turn to you, Trevor, a bit in terms of when we're looking at bringing in sex and moving or, or creating a genetic improvement in the herd. Where do you see as a breeding advisor, you're advising your clients around using sex? Well, uh, I advise my clients to, to use sex uh, with caution and kind of on the selective uh, cows that you're going to do on cows for the breeding season, cows with high fertility mm. and uh, always start earlier because like, uh, it does protect you if you get a few repeats, you won't lose the three weeks and, like, uh, and then for the heifers, like, uh, you just run a program across the board in the heifers and uh, you'll be going to lift increased fertility, increase the uh, fat and protein percentages and also uh, to uh, drive on production as best you can and uh, because, like, fertility does drive on production so it's important Okay. Keep that in the frame. I pick your team of bulls because like, I wouldn't go with one bull. I always go with, say, with heifers, say four or five bulls, and then with cows, you go with a bit more. Okay, so we've got some general rules that if we're picking, if we're doing a group of heifers, yeah. uh, and, we, and we have a large group of 50 or 60, you're saying five probably bulls. a team of four or five, yeah, five six bulls. bulls. Exactly. Okay, yeah. so if we're down and someone might have 20 heifers out there, would you use a minimum of Two, three bulls, what sort I of figures use, would you I use three bulls, and then like, uh, I would run the Sire Vice program, so like, uh, you're matching each bull with each heifer, so there's no inbreeding check. Okay. And uh, also, like, uh, you can, you know, you can, 
slick mating, they want to go more technical, you can put a higher EBI uh, animal on a lower, so a higher EBI bull on a lower EBI cow, you, you go for a higher uh, fertility on a low fertility cow. Okay, so, okay. so, so we're spreading our risk a bit. You are. D Dennis, there's a couple of expressions used around it, and we get into a bit of detail on the, uh, you know, the cow selection. First of all, we talk about something like 90% purity. Mm. What does that mean to you mm. from a technical pr point? So I suppose 90% purity means, on average, if you use 10 sex straws, or if you get 10 pregnancies, nine of them are going to be heifers. You know? So that's, that's what the purity means. On average, you, can, you might be lucky, you might get 10 out of 10, or you might get 7 or 8 out of 10. So that's, that's what the purity means on the market. Okay, because we've, ha we've had some people say, oh look, I tried it on a few, and I got a couple of bulls. Ah, sure, it doesn't work. But are we really dealing with a case of the law of small numbers there, that there is a risk that you get a little burst of bulls? That's it. So you might get five calves, and you might get three heifers, and, you know, and two bulls, sure. if you're unlucky, or you might get five heifers. So uh, it's biology you're, you're, you're dealing with here, you know, so it's not exact. But on average, um, in, in fairness, it's, the purity is very accurate. On average, it's 90%. Okay, I'm going to ask you two kind of specific things. One, I mean, first of all, it's my understanding that this year is the first year that we're actively sexing bulls in Ireland. Is that correct? Um, no, I think it was done bef before. You know, okay. the, the lab was in Moorpark before on, uh, when the trials were running. But I think commercially, um, this, is, this is the first year that it's Okay, so it's the commercial use yeah, of bulls. Yeah, yeah. Any idea what sort of numbers of bulls are getting sexed on there now? So I think the, the capacity down there in Moorpark is <coughs> 70,000 and that's split between the, the AI companies so, you know, uh, Progressive and Monster, we have our, our share of that. So, and as regards bull numbers, there's, I think there's 25 to 30 bulls being sent down there. So all the high bulls are able to be collected in the stud in Mallow, very short distance over to the, to this, the, the technology over in Moorpark. So, and I suppose the big thing this year is the, it's the top bulls. It allows us to sex the top bulls um, and have them available to herd owners for the year. And these are all bulls with proven field fertility, is that correct? Yeah, so I suppose we talk a lot about reducing our risk, Martin, uh, and the same goes for sex semen, and I suppose as a breeding company, uh, there's a couple of things we do. Number one is we don't sex the G1 bulls, so the G1 bulls are the first, are, are the test bulls out in their first season. They, obviously they pass all the lab tests, but they don't have field fertility, you referred to it last night, so they, they're not proven in the field to get cows and calves. So for that reason, we don't sex them. Um, also, we're quite selective about the bulls that they're all, you know, that, that they're all positive for field fertility. So they're very fertile bulls. So we're trying to stack all the odds in the favour, in our favour, as regards getting good results for the herd owner. So conception rate and sex compared to conventional semen. This is where people sometimes get a bit bogged down. Yeah, and I suppose when you're talking about sex versus conventional, we use this term called relative conception rate. So any of the trial work that has been done in Ireland, uh, the relative conception rate is on average 80%, but I suppose the, the slight warning in there is there's quite a large variation then. So on average it's 80%, so if you're getting 60% in cows, you can expect on average 48% uh, with sexed, but there's quite, quite a lot of variation. Some people do very well, uh, and some people not quite as well from that trial. Um, and I suppose a big reason for that maybe is, is the management which we're going to be talking about. Okay, and we'll talk about that. Yeah. I, I think there's a bit before even we get into the selection of the cows, I might come back to George and James and that, but Ben, as an AI technician going out using sex semen on, on, on farms, you're arriving on farm. What do you need to see? What's your process? How do you know that you're stacking the odds in the farmer's favour here? Well, I suppose um, before, you, before you even go out to AI the animals, you've already spoken to the farmer and the vets about the synchronization so that when you're able to do it there's no point four or five farmers synchronizing their heifers on the same day that you have to go into so when you actually arrive on farm if a farmer is using like trevor says three or four bulls in, on the heifers then if the farmer can have them split into three or four pens so each of those animals in the pens are getting the same bull so yeah. what you're then doing is you're allowing the technician to AI those animals quicker, so they're getting AI'd at the optimum time on that program, and you're going to get better results because of it. Okay, is there a key thing there, Ben, when you're saying AI and quicker, and I'm kind of alluding really to the sex piece, is there yeah. a difference for you as an AI tech handling sex versus conventional semen? There is, it really needs to get into the animal quicker. You want your thawed straw into the cow or the heifer within five minutes, okay? okay. So, obviously, the more organization is there, the quicker you'll get it into. 
Okay, so we really got to start thinking ahead here. James, in your experience, okay, you use this, and, I, and I'm worried now that everybody is going to look at it and say, oh God, I have to synchronize to use sex. We know synchronization it, it is better. We can get our timing a little bit better and we pull it more compact. But uh, the first thing I want to say is that not all animals that get sex, sex semen are synchronized, first of all. But in, in terms of selecting, uh, selecting your heifers, James, to make sure they're right, for a sync program and sex, anything in particular you do, anything you're conscious of in terms of their size or so on? Well, like everything, you, you, you need a good animal. The, like the top top ones, EVI, the, the, the size of them and everything, you know, and, and you also need your team of vets and stuff around you so it all works out for you. you know. Okay, so what you're talking about there is you have to talk to your vet to get the sync yes, program right, yes, yeah. talk to your AI technician, yes so that they're landing at the right time and you don't yes. start your sync program at the wrong day. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, your, yeah. Your, your tech is available. And, and, and from your own point of view, making sure that you have the right, you're presenting the right yeah. for, so for what feed, you have. Gene, they feed animals very, very well on that program. Yeah. Before, uh, say, six weeks before the AI season start on the heifer side, so they're, they're fed. Well so they're on a rising plane of nutrition, exactly, yeah. Trevor. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. George, your experience, and, and you mentioned a little bit that you're using sexed on individual cows. So what's driving your selection of those cows? You mentioned a little bit, you might expand mm -hmm. a little bit for us. Um, I suppose, <coughs> I, I mean, everything's recorded now. So I, I know my cows that are most fertile in terms of uh, going calf each year. Uh, and then the criteria that I'm picking, obviously, <coughs> I can type your herd. Uh, so I, while I focus on EBI, doesn't necessarily always be my main driver, you know, uh, it, it all depends. So I, when I'm picking a criteria for a cow, I, I want to make sure that her fertility, she's going calf every year. And then I, I'll just, uh, I'll AI away on that. And I'm, I'm breeding off what I perceive as my best stock, best, my best EBI, my best type. And my replacement heifers then, please God, will, will, will breed on as better, as better stock than that. Another thing that I am kind of very, very anal about is the temperature of the straw. Uh, and as you were saying before, Ben, about just getting the timing right, I, I yeah. as quickly as I can, if I can get the straw, <coughs> just a conventional straw, you're, you're not as careful, Sorry. but I think when you're using a sex straw, it's just, because I, I notice the difference from mistakes I've made year before and, and things I've tweaked and temperature of the straw going in is, is something, like if I can, anywhere between 35.5 to 37, just that seems to be... You're hitting a sweet spot there, you're getting right. Spot. I would, now, I don't know whether that's just... A placebo for me, but I definitely think that that's. Well, it'd be very important. To that's that's straw. important. Okay, yeah. temperature straw. So, uh, Dennis, I'm going to come back to you a little bit on this because there's some very, from a vet side, we're really looking at some some particular rules here. We're assuming we've, we've got a, a herd with high fertility before we're going to be used mm -hmm. use sexed. So maybe some rules around the cows, and then we might I might talk to you, Ben, then about that timing piece about when we're going to inseminate that cow. Dennis, you might take the cow rules. So cow selection, yeah, so we need to be selective, we need to stack all the odds in our favour. So when we're talking about selecting cows, we want them ideally 60 days calved, um, that they've had no health problems either during the spring or since then, so no retained afterwards, uh, LDAs, mastitis, lameness, you know, that, they're, that they've had no health problems, um, that they're cycling regularly, that their body condition score is good, so ideally 3+. plus. Um, and that the nutrition needs to be right as well then, you know, so that the herd needs to be, I suppose, it has been a tricky enough spring as regards nutrition, you know, we're hearing a bit about percentages maybe of protein, volume, back a bit, so, you know, silage quality last year maybe was, was a struggle, so we need, we need to have the nutrition right for the whole herd, uh, we need to select those cows and to stack all the odds. You know, would you advise guys to feed minerals and feed our proper yeah, all that as well, Trevor. And I suppose the other thing then is, is the parity of the cow, so first to fourth lactation. Um, and just be, be careful of those first calvers, you know, that they've coated off and that they're in good body condition. Yeah, because sometimes we see that in the spring herds, while the first calvers, <coughs> you're high genetic merit stock, but they might not just have got themselves going yeah. in that first period, particularly this year, we've had poor silage inside. Exactly. We've had a little bit of difficulty getting onto grass yeah. and so yeah. on. Ben, timing, this cow, like the <coughs> basic rules, when the cow is on standing heat versus when you're going to inseminate her as an AI tech. Yeah, to simplify it, I suppose, if I'm going in to inseminate the cow, if she was bulling the night before when he got her in for milking, we'll inseminate her with sext in the morning, okay? If she was only came bulling during the night, we'll inseminate her the following <coughs> evening. Now, the problem, the is biggest issue we have with that is technicians are so busy at peak to get back to a farmer twice a day. With conventional semen, it doesn't matter. 
because sex is very important. So what I do with some of my customers, they either start very early, as in around the 15th of April, so I have time to go back, okay, and they're risk reducing the risk as well. But the ones that are adamant of starting, say, the 1st of May, then what they do is they might buy 50 sex straws in a 200 cow herd. Mm -hmm. And what they'll do is when I go in the morning, there could be 10 cows stood there. If five of them were bulling the night before, they'll get a sex straw. Yeah. And the five that were bulling through the night, I'll give a conventional straw to. Okay. And, and, that, makes, that. Yeah, and that yeah. keeps it nice and simple. Absolutely. Because, what, again, I'm worried about when we're talking about this, everyone's going, oh my God, this is, this is all complicated. Oh no, it's very simple. So really the message there is, if the cow is super fresh on, she's going to get a conventional. <coughs> yeah. Because it's, it's going to work for her. Yeah. Yeah. And if she's, if she's going off, uh, we, we can put sex in, so yeah. even on, if you're on uh, one time a day. You guys are doing DIY, you're doing it yourself. George, so are you on uh, AM rule, PM rule, as in uh, how are you manage, uh, managing the sex straws on those cows? Um, I suppose last year uh, I synced, so it, it was very straightforward. This autumn I, I was on the AM, PM rule. It, it's easier kind of when you're DIYing mm. personally because it's uh, you know, very close to handling facilities and, and you kind of, I'd know to heifer maybe in the morning when I'd let the cows up and I'd, I'd go back to her. Mm. Uh, um, and then even after milking in the evening, uh, I, I might take a heifer and I would have noticed maybe during the day. But it's, uh, I know it, that, that sounds complicated and a lot of extra work, but mm. Uh, mm. just I think the juice is worth the squeeze if you're going to get the heifer calves, uh, especially when you're trying to improve the genetic merit and, and push on numbers in your herd. Like, because I'm, I'm still at a growing stage. So. Okay, so you're, yeah. you're, you're really trying to advance on. James, the same thing. Are you, are you going twice a day with your AI on, on the sext? No, we will. We just do it. You did the fixed time. It's fixed time, and we're doing it again now in, um, in April, about the 10th to 15th of April. Now we want to take another 70 and hit it again the same way, like, you know, okay. that's weird. Super, so that's super. I'm sexing again. Yeah. Yeah. All, all, all sexed again. Yeah. Dennis, just on that nutrition piece, um, <coughs> again, ju ju just at the moment, I know we kind of touched off it, and you, you've often said to me that expression, we really want these herds to be fully fed. E and even, let's not talk about the sex piece, mm -hmm. where we're going in doing good AI programs, high genetic merit um, AI, what does that mean to you, that herd fully fed? Yeah, so I suppose we're, we're three or four weeks out from breeding now at the moment. And, you know, what, ha what has happened during the spring has happened in cows, the body condition they're in. They're in at the moment, but from now on, we want to make sure that they're fully fed. So basically what they're taking in is, is matching what they're producing as, uh, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So that's really getting a handle on how much grass they're taking in. Um, you know, for example, a cow doing 26 litres, if she's taking in 15 kilos of grass of dry matter per day, she needs about three kilos of concentrates. So getting a handle on how much grass they're, they're eating, what they're producing, and trying to fill the gap then to make yeah. sure they're as fully fed and that their nutrition is as good as it yeah. possibly can be coming up to breeding. Okay, super. So cows <coughs> at the moment, we're g getting into mid-March, cows that have lost body condition, struggling a bit, had twins, anything like that. Yeah. What's, what's our immediate adv advice before we Yeah, so I'd really advise people now to, to take stock, do a rough body condition score the herd, and mm. what I mean by rough is pick out the thin, the under conditioned cows, so cows less than 2.75. Um, there's a couple of options from, if the cow type is suitable, you know, the once, once a day milking is a really, a really yeah. practical option. So to put them on once a day, so feed them twice a day, they, run, they go through the mm. parlour twice, and milk them once a day. So what you're doing effectively is you're dropping their output, you know, maybe by a third, and their nutrition is staying the same. So all of a sudden, they're going to be in a, in a positive energy balance, and they're going to start putting on a little bit of weight, which means they're going to gain a bit of condition, uh, and they're going to come cycling quicker. Okay, okay. It's <coughs> the vet is the number one, like, to keep him involved, like, you know, and, yeah. and uh, walk from there, like, right. you know. So when you're getting a program done, James, were you, did you get it handwritten out? Was it easy for you to follow? It was very simple, like, you know, it's the first time, like, I was very happy with the way I worked out. Okay. Like, I think okay. the big thing there, Mark, with the communication is, is to start at the end, so, yeah. so talk yeah. to Ben, talk to Ben first. Yes, so Ben yeah, first. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Without insulting anyone else, you know, to talk <laughs> to Ben first. Is yeah. he actually yeah. going to be available to AI the cows? Yeah. Yeah. William, yeah. the straws in his tank that you, that, that you want, uh, because there's no point in doing it and then finding that Ben is, is under too much pressure. And walk back, yeah. hopefully your vet is available then, you know, the drugs are available, you can order the straws. And uh, that bit of planning, I think, makes the whole thing work. And we decided totally. like, uh, on this farm to uh, use the AI technician. So he was firmly cuddy, he was fantastic. And like, uh, sure. okay. just, to, just, like, just for convenience, and again, like, just to keep that thing tight. 
Yeah. Okay, 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 yeah. super. Okay, so, so we're joining up all those dots. Yes, so yeah. there's more to, I think people get often very bogged down in this is the program, the best program, whatever. But actually, if you join up the dots of it, a lot of these programs will, will work very, very yeah. successfully and work su successfully with sex. <coughs> Just a point that was actually brought up there, Ben, you might have an opinion <coughs> on it. In general, the facilities, right? We're looking at lots and lots of cows. I think it's 12,000 inseminations per day at peak yeah. in, the, in the monster catchment. I, uh, I know that one. Yeah. Any comments there? What can help us here in terms of getting these jobs done better? Not just sinks, but general AI. Oh, in general. I mean, the, the, the biggest problem was in 2015 when quotas went, animal numbers increased, but the facilities didn't <laughs> get any better at the start. Over the years, they have improved. Yeah. Um, and, and definitely, f facilities is key for these, um, for these synchronizations. Um, not only for actually doing the AI, but obviously your facilities back at your farm for carving them, you know, um, having a lot of numbers carving at the same time. But when we go into a yard, um, you want staff there for a start. Um, you want clean, secure facilities. And obviously, if you're using three or four different bulls, you need three or four different pens or three or different four different areas that you can put them in. Okay, so talking about facilities, George, and you're a DIY user. Uh, facilities for, for for insemination. Yeah, so I mean, the one thing that I'd say is try have your pot as close as you can to where you're going to AI the, the heifers. Now, again, conventional semen, it's probably the looser rule, and if you're used to using conventional a lot, you'll probably throw two or three guns behind your back and away you go, mm -hmm. and you've got a good conception rate. But uh, I'd say when you're using sex semen, try and have your, your, your straw thrown as close as you possibly can to, to your crush. Um, and again, load your, like it's, it's a tedious, it's a bit longer, but load your heifers, if you've a couple of heifers pulled out, or a couple of cows pulled out, load one first, and it's, you know, back and forth, back and forth, but like, again, that little bit of time you're taking, it's, it's really going to, I, I personally feel it will pay off dividends, and you know, it sounds, it sounds very complicated, and this all sounds yeah. like we're, mm -hmm. we're really digging into synchronization, but at the end of the day, it's a straw and a cow, with just little, little tweaks, and I think mm. it's, you know, it is the few, it is where we're heading. I think, in, in, in for you know, bull calves and all that. I think sex is really where we're heading. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. You, and yourself, James. In terms yeah. Well, of it's, like it's manpower. I, I could allude to George yeah. there. It's it's manpower on the day is handling them right and yeah. taking them easy. Like you know, like yeah. d these are your breeding animals that produce them for you, and you just have to handle them right. And as have the guys with you, you have no problems. Yeah. Like, you know. So th what I'm learning from all of this. It can sound very complicated. Simplify it down. Yeah, yeah. Get it down, yeah. get the communication, simplify it down, plan, plan, and plan again. Yeah. And then these, th these things yes. uh, can work for you. A point then is just about flexibility. If an animal is, is not, we've bought our sex straws, we want to put them in, but what do you say if you think an animal is not right? Or yeah, so I yeah. suppose we have to be flexible. Um, like the weather is one thing, Martin, you know, if, if the weather goes really bad for a few days and it's gone cold and wet and intakes are going to be down in grass, uh, maybe just switch to conventional for a few days, wait for the weather to pick back up again. Um, after a, a sink program, when you're pulling the prids or the cedars, if an animal has lost a, a prid or a cedar, mark her and, um, and make sure she gets conventional, don't want to put the sex straw on her. And I suppose with the cows, picky enough cows that are going to that you want to use sex on so if you have 20 straws pick 30 or 40 cows because as ben was saying earlier on you know the cow that you want she may be too fresh the morning that she's on and she needs yeah. you know she needs to get a conventional okay. straw mm -hmm. so that timing is important and don't be i suppose don't get the urge just to put a sex straw on her if the timing is right if, if the timing is not right use um use a conventional straw yeah, so the also, so the quality of your heat detection here is going to be important yes, as it's well. It's really important. Heat detection in general, James. Yeah. What's your system on the farm? Well, I'm using um, heat um, heat timer since hope as it is okay. now. We're using it for the last 15 years, like, and it is it has made our life an awful lot simpler. Like, you know. you're very much close your eyes, power ahead, and oh, and the, the drafting and it's just easy, cool with Simple. the animals like you know just okay. uh, work for Yvonne, like, very happy with it. one of the best pieces of technology I've ever invested in okay okay know, yeah. very happy with it what about yourself George not quite not quite there yet James <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it's very important it's we all have differences yeah, yeah, in yeah, what yeah. we're doing very yeah. much so the start of my journey uh, no I'm, I'm tail paint and, and uh, like an absolute freak uh, walking around the place any kind of little cut or bruise on the cow or 
it's marking a cow's back. Oh, is yeah. she bullet? Is she yeah. bullet? I'm still still at that point, but uh, you know, definitely a, a heat detection, some sort of a technical device. And do you use scratch cards or do you use tail paint or uh, tail paint? Tail paint and, yeah. uh, I just find scratch cards. Tail paint, I think, okay. is just the handiest. Yeah, yeah, diff yeah, different colors. Yeah, the easiest. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, listen. Slowly but surely, but uh, I think technology down the road is, is probably technology down yeah, the road. Yeah, yeah, okay. is the answer. Yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. But Ben, in your experience, going into lots of crushes, meeting lots of cows, and meeting lots of heifers in there, is there a are there many animals presented to you that are not on heat? It, 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 you it's know. getting better. It's getting better. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay, <laughs> good. Yeah. After many years of looking at them, there, look the. the the technology is expensive, as George said, you know, mm. down the line he's going to go down that line. But scratch cards on maiden heifers, mm. fine with paint on maiden heifers, they're not heavy enough really to rub it off well. Very good. Whereas, whereas scratch cards are very good. Now, the biggest mistake that people do with scratch cards is they see one little tail flick that's come around and taken off a tiny little bit, yeah. and they put her up for me. And I look, oh, and you just know yeah, that yeah, she's yeah, not yeah, going to yeah. be on. Okay? So make sure it's rubbed off so well. well yeah. uh, Two thirds to three quarters of it needs to be completely raw, and they'll go whatever color they are, whether red, green. They'll go red or green, and then the more a cow rubs or a heifer rubs, it'll actually go white. Okay. Okay. Um, and they've, they've, there's plenty of activity there. You can you can put in four or five heifers into a crush, and if there's three, but you you just cast your eye straight across, and you know exactly the ones that aren't going to be bullied. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I think you like Dennis after if a sync program has been done in heifers, do you like to go in and maybe heat detect them for the for the repeats, or <coughs> how about bull numbers in there for repeats? Okay, for the repeats, I suppose th the thing you have to remember about a sync program is great. You do all your animals in the one day, but then, you know, whatever is going to repeat, they're going to repeat over a small number of days, you know, 18 to 24 days, um, probably four to five days. So you've got to think, if you're using bulls, have you enough bull power? Um, and really, I, s I think, if you've gone that far, why not put on the scratch cards on day 16 or 17, yeah. um, and just really, Put, put the effort into heat detecting for those, you know, for those six or seven days and pick up your repeats. And what day after, after doing the AI would you adjust the bull? Would you, would you go 15, 16 Oh, days? So you could leave the bull run from, you know, day two or three to day 16 or 17. If the numbers are going to be high, I would say pull the bull because he's only going to maybe get injured for those few days if there's okay. a lot of activity. Uh, AI, put on your scratch cards, um, even scratch cards and crayon, yeah. they do work brilliant yeah. together. Um, heat detect for those few days, pick up your repeats, uh, when the repeats, the repeats start to drop off, then day 23, 24, you can leave off your bull. Yeah. The next round of them are going to be 36 to 48 days. They're going to be spread out. They're going to be very, very few, hopefully. Fine, yeah. 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 Uh, and your bull can pick up the, the few for, for the okay. last, for the third round. I'm going to summarize a, a, a few things I got out of this. First of all, let's have some confidence with sex. It's improving the whole time. Uh, we are very careful in the type of sex bulls we're putting into the marketplace in terms. We know their field fertility. Uh, but we, we must be aware, again, the law of small numbers, okay? Uh, so, so that's very important, but we've very, we've great confidence within the technology. Synchronization programs can certainly help with sexting, get our timing right, but we must get our communication correct to get it right. Often we find the fault with sync programs, we've missed an injection, uh, cedars have yeah. fallen out, whatever, uh, whatever is there. Try and get our facilities right for our AI, AI guys to get, to get through large numbers quickly and allow them uh, to get good AI done during the season. Heat detection is key here, that we get our times right in heat detection and pay attention to that. So I, I think anybody like to, a, any last parting shot? George, any parting comment on your fertility <coughs> management? Uh, well, my, listen, uh, it's improving all the time. I think that, uh, particularly with AI and, and guys that might be thinking, oh, it might be for me, it's just, it's simple. I, I, I was afraid of it at the start. I was afraid of getting into the mm. AI. I was afraid of doing it all. It's easy to throw out a couple of bulls and away you go. But over the last couple of years, <coughs> I've just, the gains that I've gotten in my herd, in my milk report and everything from just taking that little bit of time. And it's, it's simple. It's simple once you get your head around it. So it's definitely worth it. Okay, definitely make, worth make that plan. Yeah, make that yeah. plan. Any comment, Trevor? Yeah, well, like, you know, it's very important to do the synchronization on your heifers. I like, give you the best chance because they do carry the highest dynamic merit in your herd. Okay. And, like and we want to get AI into that group. AI into that group. Okay. Exactly. James, okay. are the benefits for you? Well, for the first time doing it, I'm, I'm very happy with it and uh, I recommend oh. everybody to, to spend okay. their money wisely and, and give it a shot. We're going to come back in September, October and we're going yeah. to look under the legs. Right? 100%. That's the most important thing. <laughs> Dennis, <laughs> parting shot. Yeah, I suppose three, three or four weeks out. I mentioned the nutrition earlier on, but maybe pick out those thinner cows now, put them on once a day or feed them extra. 
Another one is, is the problem cows, you know, so the ones that had some issues during the spring, George mentioned the pre-breeding scan, but even be selective, pick out the ones you think might have a problem, get them checked out now and get them washed out and treated if necessary. So now is the time to work on those cows. Um, equally, the late calvers, you know, watch the nutrition in them, their dry matter intake is going to be down, so maybe consider putting them on once a day. And if you feel like doing a bit of pre-breeding heat detection, you could do a simple job, just tail paint them all up now, maybe check them once a week um, and figure out those cows that are not cycling at the start of the breeding So find season. those non-bullers, get them treated before the mating yeah. start date, yeah. or sink them in even. Exactly. Okay, exactly. brilliant. Yeah. Ben? I suppose we've, we, we've covered it. I mean, communication is key on these synchros. Vet, farmer, technician. Not necessarily in that order, but technician probably first. But, you know, once you've done it once, and you've been taking that brave step to spend more money and go and do this, you'll do it every year if it works right. Okay, the sex semen straw, straw is available for people to use? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay. especially with a new lab. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks, guys, that was very informative. I really appreciate the time, and thanks, James, for hosting us today. You're welcome, lads. Hopefully yeah. we haven't put you out too much. <laughs> uh, Please, God. And we very much appreciate it. You're very welcome. So thanks, thanks again. Guys.